My name is Anthony Lewis, I'm curator for Scottish history for Glasgow Museums and I'd like to introduce you to this painting here of Lord Mungo Murray, painted in 1683. The first point I'd like to make is introduce Lord Mungo Murray as the fifth son of the Marquis of Athol, who was a leading politician in the government of Scotland for King Charles II and then James Stuart, Duke of Albany and York. The government of Charles II is represented by his currency and his coins and in Scotland uh, these coins carried the arms of Scotland, Ireland, England and France's independent kingdoms confederated together under the rule of the Stuarts. Where Lord Mungo Murray, representing Scotland dressed in his kilt, fits into this dynamic is that this painting was painted to hang beside a painting of someone called O'Neill O'Neill who represented Ireland as the quintessential Irishman. And the paintings hung in Lord Ormond's house in Kilkenny and also in St James Square in London for any visitor coming in would see that there's Scotland and there's Ireland loyal to the Stuart government, loyal to the king. And this aspect of fealty and loyalty uh, to the family of Murray through the Lord Mungo Murray being the son of Athol and also to his king and to the, the Stuart family is central to the context of this painting. Looking at Lord Mungo Murray here, we see him dressed in his tartan and with his uh, kilt hose and his bonnet as the quintessential Scot. This is the, an important painting for showing someone wearing a kilt at this time. He's dressed to the nines. He's dressed in what's equivalent in our money is today of about £10,000 worth of clothes. Who wears £10,000 of pounds worth of clothes every day? This is not an everyday kind of painting. And Lord Mungo Murray is presenting himself as someone who would fit in to the courtly world of James Stuart and Charles II. Someone who would be noticed in Holyrood House or in Whitehall as representing a leading political family. He's dressed for the occasion and he's representing his country and family. So if we look at details of the painting, what do they tell us? Uh, uh, look at the shoes. The shoes are actually dancing shoes. They're not hunting shoes. Why is Mungo wearing dancing shoes? Well, one explanation might be because this painting was always intended to represent him in this courtly mode being in the presence of uh, other, lords, other lords, other politicians, and even the royal family themselves. There was a tradition uh, of the younger sons of Scottish nobles reciting poetry of uh, welcoming uh, important visitors, such as the royals. So you can imagine uh, Lord Mungo Murray being prepared uh, to, for such occasions. So maybe the dancing shoes might have gotten ready for a mask or a ball or an entertainment at Holyrood House or at Whitehall or for, the, for an auspicious occasion when James or Charles are throwing an event. Uh, so this prepares Mungo for the kind of life and the kind of society and the kind of occasions that he was prepared uh, to enter in as an adult. We see Lord Mungo Murray carrying a hunting gun and hunting was the key courtly sport uh, for Charles II and James, Duke of Albany and York. They were obsessed with hunting. So Mungo is very much fitting in with that courtly pursuit, being the, the little teenage hunter with his hunting gun on the estate. He's showing that he knows about hunting. He's being prepared to participate in the noble way of life of hunting. Having seen Mungo the hunter, uh, we can then also see in later life Mungo the soldier and in some way him being trained in the hunt uh, prepared him for his soldiering years later on and being able to read a landscape and being able to act with stealth and of course being able to use firearms. And indeed in later life as a young man he was involved with the feuding wars with the Frasers of Loch Eel, and then uh, he went on to be a captain of the Darien expedition where his life ended in Panama in 1700. So in conclusion, I hope that now when you're looking at Lord Mungomar, you can understand the context of courtly life that he belonged to and also the life he was to inherit as a soldier. Hello, I'm Ralph. I'm curator of European Arms and Armour here at Glasgow Museums. Um, and welcome to Kelvin Grove. And today I'm going to talk about this wonderful painting by John Michael Wright of Lord Mungo Murray. Now today I'm not going to talk about the weapons that he uses for killing and maiming humans. Today I'm going to talk about the weapons for killing and maiming animals. Lord Mungo 
is showing us how important hunting is to his status, to his nobility, uh, to the fact that he's allowed to hunt, and especially to hunt deer. In the background of the painting, very faintly above Lord Mungo's arm, you can make out some stags, and they're just grazing, and they don't know what's coming to them very soon. One of the most obvious ways he's pointing out his right to hunt as a nobleman is this spectacular long gun that he holds in his right hand. From the walnut stock at the bottom to the decorated steel barrel, the gun is called a long gun for obvious reasons, but also the length of it allows a better aim and a truer shot to shoot deer with. This is slightly before the era of rifling barrels. Lord Mungo wouldn't have loaded this himself. It would have been loaded by his servant or ghillie in the background. And it has a long ramrod just set underneath the barrel. The ramrod is used for ramming the ball and powder and charge into the barrel. Now not only is Lord Mungo carrying his long gun, he also has in the background, skipping along behind him, his ghillie or servant. And this man is attired very similar but in a, in a much cheaper version of the clothing that Lord Mungo wears. And he carries a bow and quiver full of arrows. Now this is very interesting indeed. As far as we know, no bows from the period that um, Lord Mungo was painted in survive. And it's incredibly detailed depiction of the bow. You can see that the string is loose, so the bow has to be flexed to have the bowstring set on it. There are also beautiful little decorations tied at each end. The slight recurve at the end where there would be a horn knock on each end of the bow to fit the string. And not only is he carrying a bow, but on his hip, set slightly behind, is this strange feathery shape. And what this is, is a quiver, probably of rough goat hide a quiver that holds the arrows for the bow. Now whether Lord Mungo is going to shoot with his gun or with his bow, the deer in the background have a very limited chance of living not long after his gun has been shot. So Lord Mungo's long gun could have been made by a skilled artisan in Scotland, or possibly in London, very good quality weapons are being produced. From the beautiful walnut stock, where you can see the grain of the wood, through to the flintlock, and the top of the barrel here, decoration, probably gilding, across the barrel, you see decorative, decorative rings here, and little stippling below to create that effect, even a little bit of shine where the polish has been. So Lord Mungo, not only is he wearing the weapons of a Highland warrior to express his Highland identity, he's bearing, and his ghillie are bearing hunting weapons to state how important he is as a nobleman, as a man who has the right to hunt. My name is Rebecca Quinton and I'm the curator of European Dress and Textiles and today I'd like to talk to you about this amazing portrait by John Michael Wright of Lord Mungo Murray, a younger son of the Earl of Attle. It was painted in about 1683 and is a fantastic one as a dress historian as it shows one of the earliest depictions of full Highland dress that has survived today.
And it's not just any Highland dress. This is the Highland dress of a young man who's been born into wealth and is flaunting his clothing. So this lovely doublet that's in a slightly earlier style that he was probably still wearing because it's short-waisted and suits his outfit here today is in a very finely woven wool. It's then been beautifully embroidered with silver and silver gilt thread. This is a style of embroidery that we get across the continent and into the courts of Europe. There's a wonderful example of a suit being worn by James, Duke of York at his wedding in a very similar embroidery 10 years earlier. He is then teaming it with the quintessential piece of Highland dress, this fantastic plaid. This is one long length of a very finely woven wool. The tartan here predates clan tartan and would have been a choice either by himself or the weaver. You can see the quality in it. This is one where the weaver has introduced a very, very fine count and lots of different colours in his set. This fantastically long cloth, the big wrap or the filly moor, in this case has here, we can see a string that would have been a drawstring around his waist to help gather these soft folds to create the lower garment. And the excess length of his plaid at this state was then wrapped around and really does give a fantastic swing and shows off the plaid here. Later in the 18th century, the two pieces will be cut and will end up with a kilt and a separate plaid. So here we have the fullness of probably three meters of cloth wrapped around the body. This is a garment that we would have had throughout the Highlands but for other people who don't have the wealth, it would have been in a coarser wool and probably in a check that was only two or three colours. Here it is the finest. Look at these gentle gathering pleats here. This tells us of the high quality, the dense weave of this wool. This is a gentleman who has spent a lot of money, or at least his father's money. An outfit like this at the time would have cost a huge amount of money. From the tip of his ostrich plumed, bonnet through down to his gilt garters and his leather brogues. This is a gentleman that is showing his aristocratic privilege, his wealth in his clothing. Add to that his choice to have Highland dress in the tartan, he is establishing himself not just as an international elite, but as a Scottish, a Highland gentleman. I'm Jo Meacock, I'm the curator of British art at Glasgow Museums and I'm standing in the Scottish Identity in Art Gallery in Kelvin Grove and beside this impressive portrait by John Michael Wright, a Highland chieftain portrait of Lord Mungo Murray and this was painted around 1683 and it's such an important painting for the heritage of Scotland because it's the first major painting to show someone full length in Highland attire. Mungo Murray was the fifth son of the second Earl of Athol and Lady Amelia Stanley. Um, and he's shown here as a Highland warrior. So this painting is not only important in terms of the development of Highland dress, but also in terms of the making and bearing of Scottish weaponry. So for a painting that appears so Scottish, you might be surprised to learn that it actually wasn't painted in Scotland. It was painted in Ireland, commissioned by the Duke of Ormond of Kilkenny Castle in County Kilkenny and he was a relative of Mungo Murray on his mother's side. So this highland landscape that you see in the background with its mountains and red deer, is pure fabrication. The whole painting is a piece of theatre. It's all about Mungo Murray and his family in relation to Britain and the rest of the world. And it shows how cosmopolitan Highland Scotland was at the time. And this in contrast to the caricatures presented by um, the English press and commentators who talked about it being a barbarous place. The artist John Michael Wright, he wasn't only a painter, he was also um, a, a distinguished collector um, and antiquarian and he spent time in Rome moving in select circles among connoisseurs and patrons and he was back in London in 1656 um, where he received a number of important um, royal commissions. And here he paints 15-year-old Mungo Murray in this impressive swagger pose derived from antique Greek and Roman models. He's got one hand on his hip, the other one um, stretched out holding his long gun for hunting. And he has his belted plaid um, rather flamboyantly thrown over his left shoulder following um, classical drapery. And this is how the cultured elite um, of Europe in, the, in his day were being painted. 
his bonnet that you can see on his head with the ostentatious ostrich feather plume and pendant pearl brooch. This derived from Flemish fashion. The basket-hilted broadsword that you can see here would have had a blade that had been made in Germany. This finely embroidered doublet um, follows French and English court fashion, although a bit out of date. To go back to the ostrich feather plume here, this would have come from Africa. And this reminds us that Scotland at the time was developing into a powerful um, trading nation. And this very much ties in with Mungo Murray's story and also his demise. He was the fifth son. He was never going to inherit any land. And like so many younger sons of aristocratic families, he became part of Scotland's colonial history. Funded by his parents, he joined an expedition to Darien in Central America, led by the Company of Scotland trading to Africa and the Indies. And this was to set up a, um, a, a plantation and a trading post. But Mungo Murray died soon after arrival, only age 32, probably from tropical fever. So this painting, there's so much bound up in it in terms of um, cosmopolitan Scotland, in terms of taste and fashion and dress, in terms of power and politics, trade and colonialism in late 17th century Scotland. So I think we need to call it Mungo Murray in the world. If you enjoyed this talk, or if you didn't, um, we'd love to hear your feedback. So please do leave your comments in our online survey. Thank you.